Hi, everyone. Welcome, and thank you for joining us. My name is Erin Beasley. I'm the U.S. Director for Ecosystem Restoration Camps. We are an organization that supports a network of local restoration initiatives around the world. And I'm thrilled to be moderating today's symposium to make the connections between ecosystem restoration and climate action and the potential for all actors from governments to companies, communities, and the individuals joining this presentation today to get involved and to take action on some of the most important strategies and activities of our time. We're here today in the context of COP26 and the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration because governments and scientists around the world have all come together in recognizing um, to take, that we need to take urgent action on climate change. We need to reduce fossil fuel emissions in order to avoid the worst impacts of climate change. And at the same time, we know that nature and the way we use land has a significant potential to draw down carbon from the air and into living abundant ecosystems. These plants and trees and other vegetation on land and coastal systems are some of our greatest allies to soak up carbon from the air. And we also know that people have a crucial role in this action. So as we invite the speakers for today's presentation, I want to share a quote from author and writer, Robin Wall Kimmerer, who talks about the importance of, of people in this process. She says that restoring land without restoring relationship is an empty exercise. It's relationship that will endure and relationship that will sustain the restored land. Sometimes the scale for action in restoration activities can either be overwhelming or sometimes motivating and inspiring. Today, we'll hear from speakers who have accepted this transformation as part of their own challenge and are taking action with governments and citizens alike. Um, in our first round of speakers, we'll hear from John Liu, founder of Ecosystem Restoration Camps Movement, and Renee Zamora, restoration expert from the World Resources Institute. After their presentations, we'll take a brief round of questions from the audience. So you can add your questions into the YouTube um, live chat. And also please um, feel free there to let us know where you're joining from. After those questions, we'll take a brief break and we'll come back with three additional speakers who have been leading restoration initiatives on the ground in the United States, Somalia, and Egypt, and hear about how they're connecting with their community and, and how they're building leadership within their organization to achieve restoration on the ground. So let's get started with John Liu. Um, John is the founder of the Ecosystem Restoration Camps Movement, as well as the Ecosystem Ambassador for the Common Land, Common Land Foundation and Advisory Council Member, Advisory Board Member for the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration. John, we're pleased to have you here and we'll start with a few moments of comments on this video. Hello. I'm so happy to have this opportunity to talk with you remotely today. And uh, I'm very grateful to the Common Land Foundation and the Mustard Seed Trust 
that have made it possible for me to continue to do this work for so long. And it's my pleasure to talk with you about the ecosystem restoration camps movement. So there's a long backstory to this, but it's too long for this meeting. So I would like to show you my academia page and recommend that if you're interested in how I got to this point, that you take a look at that and you'll find many films and many papers that have been published. About five years ago in 2016, I started imagining and dreaming about waking up in camp and lots of people were camping and they were getting up and very happily going off to restore ecosystem function. And actually, when I had that dream the first time, I sort of said, well, who's going to do that? I felt a little like Eeyore in, uh, you know, in Winnie the Pooh. Like who, who, I'd been making films about ecosystem restoration for a long time, and I, I just thought, well, people don't seem to be listening to this. But a strange thing happened. I kept having these dreams, and so I thought I would write about it. And so I wrote an essay that ended up in Permaculture Magazine, and then it was reprinted in the Cosmos Journal, and then it circulated around on social media, and I was surprised to find that first hundreds, then thousands, and then tens of thousands of people were discussing this, and that they, they were saying that they really liked this idea, and some were actually saying that they were having this kind of dream themselves. So it was a little bit like um, close encounters of the third kind or something where people are making a mashed potatoes into a landscape where they're trying to figure out where the spaceship is going to land. And, um, but when that was clear, then we needed to make a foundation. And we thought, well, how would we do that? And I think the traditional way would be to go out and raise lots of money with the traditional capital concentrations, other institutions, but we started talking about having an egalitarian and a participatory way to do this, so we said, well, who would share? Who would share a few euros per month, 10 euros per month, let's say? And when a thousand people pledged that they would share 10 euros per month, we made a, a, a foundation. And that foundation, then we started to think, well, we have to make a camp. So where would we make the first camp? And we decided to do this in Spain, where uh, the Common Land Foundation has another large project with about a million hectares in restoration. And so we, we built this first camp in the first year. And then in the second year, we had two camps. The second one was in Mexico. And the third year, there were 21 camps. And in the fourth year, there were 37 camps. And this year, we're going to definitely go certainly around 50, maybe more. It sort of depends on how many members join the Ecosystem Restoration Camps Foundation to support this kind of activity, because there are many, many more camps that want to join, but we have difficulty being able to help all of these organizations and individuals that are ready to start camps. So as, as the movement grows, then we're going to be able to support many more camps. And these camps are in very, very interesting places. In Peru and Guatemala and in, in uh, Kenya and in Morocco and Somalia and India, there's even one developing in Syria together with the United Nations and Gaia University. And the fact is, if we all work together, we're somewhat unlimited 
in how to do this. And I'm very happy that uh, Zendesk is working with the ecosystem restoration camps to make a knowledge hub. So this concept is that not only can people go camping, but in doing this, they're working to increase the soil fertility. They're working to increase the hydrological function. They're working to protect and increase biodiversity. And they, in doing this, they can lower the surface temperatures. They can alter reducing evaporation rates, increasing evapotranspiration, and creating microclimates and recharging the lower hydrological cycle, increasing fertility and productivity in regenerative agricultural systems, and in restoring natural zones and rewilding. So all of this is very exciting to me because these are the subjects that I've been studying, observing, documenting, and communicating about for decades now. And it's something that changes the, the dynamics. We have had an expert class, and we've had endless conversations in the convening of the parties of the various UN conventions. But in my experience, it's difficult to see people who are well-dressed, wearing Italian suits and cufflinks, getting out there and really increasing soil fertility or planting. And a lot of these conversations have been, been way too simplified. So I've been talking about tree planting, for instance. Well, that would be like talking about building a roof on a house before you've built the foundation. So if you're not thinking about the hydrological cycle or the soil fertility or the microbial or fungal communities or the, the pioneer species that develop these systems, then talking about trees is a bit, well, premature. And if you're expecting that just planting out trillions of trees is somehow going to work, then you have to realize, one, that tree plantations are not forests. And that planting trees are not the same as tending trees and making sure that they, they survive. So in many of these hasty tree planting projects where the tree va value is a few pennies or 20 cents or 40 cents or something, a couple of dollars, this is ridiculous. The value of functional ecosystems is vastly higher than anything that human beings have ever made and everything that human beings will ever make. And so the idea that uh, we want to have some poor, unfortunate people somewhere slaving away in the most degraded parts of the world and we're not willing to support them to do this is, is, is not very uh, correct. It's not very fair. So we need to understand the value of ecosystem function and we need to see that there are wonderful ways to do this. So I hope you'll all learn as much as you can about the ecosystem restoration camps and about participation because this is a way we can all instantly participate. And when we do this, we are creating a method where we can change not only the ecological outcomes, but also the social outcomes. We can address many historic mistakes. We can honor and respect and celebrate the accomplishments of indigenous cultures around the world who, in fact, were more developed than the cultures that came to try to dominate them and to eradicate them. So let's go camping 
and restore a little bit of paradise every day. Thanks very much. Hello, everybody. I guess, am I, am I live here? So that was a recording that I made and uh, I'm so glad to have that opportunity. And I just wanted to add that while the COP is going on and we're looking at all these theoretical policy decisions and so on, we need to recognize that, that climate change is a physical problem. It's not a theoretical problem. So we're gonna to have to physically change this. And this is what I really love about the ecosystem restoration camps, that we can all have a role to play and that we can work together to understand what we need to do instead of be confused about what's going on, we can do a type of collaborative inquiry for collective intelligence. And in this way, we can all know exactly how you lower the surface temperatures of the earth, how you actually sequester carbon, how you ensure food security, how you make sure that there's no toxicity in, in the soils and in the, and, and we have to value that. We have to realize that that's more valuable than buying and selling things. It's more valuable than anything else that human beings can do. So if we have a existential threat from climate change, then mitigating and adapting to climate change is the most valuable thing you can do. And so in these ecosystem restoration camps, it's the lowest cost and it's the highest impact to engage all of the people in, in this effort. And that's what we need to do. We need to make ecosystem restoration the central issue of human civilization. So if that's the central issue for human civilization, then there's nothing that will stop us from doing this. But if we continue to, to suggest that, well, all these things that happened in the past, um, you know, they're not so bad, we'll just kind of carry on and forget about that and we'll just keep going with the way it is. I think we're gonna have to, we're gonna have to do something more, you know, more complete, more holistic. We're gonna have to look at the injustice of the past and say that that's unacceptable. <laughs> And we don't wanna carry the injustice into the future, we want it to stop now. So we can't go back and, and make these things that happened earlier not happen, but what we can do, we can decide what the future is. So I hope you'll all join the ecosystem restoration camps, we'll all work together and we'll take care of this as quickly as possible. So thank you very much. I'm here to answer questions with everyone else. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, John. I think you really have start, begun the conversation um, on a great foot. And I think we'll see in, in the rest of the, the, presenter, the presentations, the scale, the potential scale of this action and the possibility of camps as places for action. And um, we'll also hear a bit more about that later from our, our speakers in the second round. Um, I'd also like to remind folks who are listening through the YouTube channel, if you'd like to share um, in the YouTube chat where you're tuning in from, we'd love to hear um, who is interested in this conversation. And if you have questions based on John's presentation or our, our next presenter, um, please add them to the chat as we go along and we'll take a round of questions um, after the second presenter. So now I'd like to introduce Renee Zamora. Yes. Renee is Guatemalan and senior forest economist and coordinator of the research and innovation initiative of 20 by 20 and the global restoration initiative at the World Resources Institute. 
In this role, Renee coordinates the Restoration Policy Acceleration Program to encourage innovation in public economic incentives. Renee has a PhD in Forest Engineering and Economics from Oregon State University in the United States. And in 2019, Renee received the recognition of Outstanding Doctoral Research Award from the International Union of Forest Research Organizations. Renee's work is reflected in more than 30 publications in scientific journals. And among projects developed across the Americas is the creation of a sustainability index for the restoration of landscapes that allows monitoring of restoration of degraded lands. The index has also supported Costa Rica, Chile, Peru, Guatemala, and Colombia in the development of their national landscape restoration plans. Welcome, Renee, and thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, Irene. Thanks for the invitation, and, and, and um, happy to be here sharing with you some of the experiences we have so far with the ecosystem restoration and the Initiative 20 by 20 in Latin America. And, um, and the links with science, as, as John was saying, you know, this is a real issue we are facing with climate change um, that um, uh, our people in my country and other countries will, I mean, is facing, is facing every day and we need to find ways to mitigate, adapt to, to these effects that are coming. Um, I just wanna share with you a very short presentation on, on some of the why we're doing this, what, it, what is some of the science behind this in really simple terms, um, um, just so you know that this is a very complex issue. When we talk about ecosystems, it's a different, um, different components and it's, it's, not a, it's not a simple issue, but I will share with you right now my screen and then uh, we can start really quick. Um, just checking if you can see my screen airing or our moderators, um, I hope you see that. Okay, yeah, just so you, you have a context here, um, there are different terms that is being used. Um, you have heard of them. Um, uh, restoration, just as a word. Uh, some people use ecological restoration, some others are using landscape restoration, uh, ecosystem restoration now with the decade. I think the one, you know, the, the important thing here, and I think uh, the reason why the UN decade is named the ecosystem restoration is because, you know, ecosystem is a, is a more global, it's, it's different. We, we live in different land uses. We, we have cities, we have agricultural lands, we have forests, uh, we have water, we have mangroves, we have different land uses. And, and we are, as, as population is increasing, we are intensively using our resources and that's changing the landscapes, you know. So the ecosystem approach, I think, is, is the one that uh, um, helps a lot to understand all these, systems, these uh, links between the systems that are, that are you know, related. The, the easiest example to understand is, of, of course, you have a watershed, and then you have water coming in the upper part of the watershed that, has, that is going down. You have populations that depends on the water downstream uh, and, and you are not making sure that the, the, the water is, is being captured in the upper parts by the forest, in this case, cloud forest, then you are um, causing some cause effect uh, situation or you are, you are causing a scarcity in some areas of, of, the, of the watershed just because you are managing other areas in a bad way. Um, so this, this is a system approach. So what you do has an effect. You might not see it, but every day, everything we do has an effect in other parts of the, of the landscape and with other people, with other things. So this is, the, this is why um, we use, in many cases, landscape and, and ecosystem as an internship way to, to see it. But basically, the, the message is that is, this is a very complex. We are not talking about one unit, one project, one hectare of, of land that we would like to restore. We are talking about how that hectare can affect other hectares and it's related to the, to the entire system that we are trying to, to get better. Um, actually, you know, the many cases we use the word rehabilitation as a way to, 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 um, to explain better, you know, that we are rehabilitating certain areas. We are not coming back to the forest we have before, uh, I think, thousand years ago. Because you know we have people living there, we have land that is being used to produce food that we eat every day. So we need to manage the balance of all those things. 
without uh, degrading that, the land more. In that sense, you know, we have uh, at the political level, a uh, big movement that uh, started in 2011 with the bond challenge. And then uh, from the bond challenge, we have two initiatives that uh, were born. Um, there is one more in Asia that is being crafted. Um, but basically we have FR120 by 20 in Latin America, FR100 in Africa. These are countries that are committing to restore land. But for a politician, maybe if you ask about the ecosystem approach, they won't understand the world. Uh, so that's why, you know, the, the, the way probably these countries started to commit hectares to restore is, is using the, the land, the, the area commitment, you know. We will restore millions of hectares. We are not talking about, you know, restoring specific ecosystems. They are talking about restoring a number which is meaningful for them, but it's more complex than that. And when you see all these commitments, you see that there is big challenges here because, you know, each of these countries have made a lot of commitments, um, millions of hectares. And you might wonder, you know, how we are going to achieve that target if we don't work together. And that's one of the challenges we have, you know, how we bring the science and also the, the financial resources so we can do this in a way that it can provide us with benefits in the long term, but also, you know, we can achieve our targets. The key here, maybe the, and the message is that when we when we see these million hectares, probably we are not talking about doing interventions in every single hectare. If you see, for example, my country, Guatemala, 1.2 million hectares, that's a lot of land for a small country. Uh, I don't see, you know, that we will be doing activities in every hectare of, one, of those 1.2 million hectares. But what I see and what we are trying to achieve is, is to develop areas in strategic areas in these 1.2 million hectares that will benefit the entire system. So let's say, you know, there are key strategic areas in these 1.2 million hectares that are more valuable than others. For example, the areas that are close to national parks, the areas where people are um, uh, having uh, food security problems and you need to provide them with, uh, with, with this safe net with uh, trees that provide fruits. Those are areas that are priority for, for many objectives. And those are the areas we need to influence because if we influence those areas, we can have an effect in other areas. So that's, that's the, I think the key of this component, how we intervene certain areas so we can have a, an effect in the, in the system. You know? Because you know, achieving an effect in the entire system uh, is not uh, is is very difficult, and it won't be probably possible. But we and we can reach the scale that we need for climate to to face climate change if we do that. Um, just want to mention, you know, that climate change is about carbon, of course, and, and greenhouse emissions. And we have developed a map in in, in WRI on on carbon the potential of forest to capture carbon and where we are losing forests, where we are losing that potential. If you remember in the school, the uh, uh, question of photosynthesis, you know, the tree captures the CO2, uses water and then converts that with energy into biomass and could be leaves, uh, um, timber, I mean, other, other biomass. Um, and that, that biomass is fixed, but if you, if you cut that tree, then you lose that capacity to capture. You know. And that's what is happening in many places that we are losing that capacity. But when, when you see the, 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 there are areas, you know, where people is using the trees in a sustainable way, like communities in, in, in many areas in Latin America, where they are cutting some trees, but they are still, you know, maintaining, maintaining. So they are using the forest, but also they are conserving the forest, protecting the forest by sustainably using the forest. So what we need to see is not with the areas where we are losing that capacity or we are really cutting trees. What we need to see is the areas where we are changing the land use. So you have a forest and then you are cutting all that forest to plant um, agricultural crops or, or, or have cattle ranching. That's, that's, the, the, that, that's a problem because then we lose the capacity. But if you are managing the forest like in the Mayan reserve in, in, in Northern Guatemala, where the communities are cutting some trees uh, but at the same time are planting and are managing the forest, it, that's a way, you know, that's a way to protect the forest too. So when we put this together, you, you can see here, where are the areas where the purple areas here, where you can see the changes, you know, big changes in the, in the entire, um, where, where we are losing more than we are gaining. So we are basically changing the land use. We are cutting the, 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 the nature 
to do something else. The problem, and that's where the only reason why I, I put this, and I don't want to um, go into the details of carbon or anything, it's just that the, the discussion is about carbon much. You see in the newspapers, carbon, carbon, carbon. Uh, planting trees is probably uh, good. Some people say planting trees is probably bad. Uh, but my point here is that when we are restoring ecosystems, it's not just about carbon. It's, it's about more, much more than that. It's about the biodiversity, it's about the water, it's about the soil. So this is, this is a simplification, of course, because carbon is the one that is causing in part, in great part, the, the global warming. And trees capture carbon, that's important too. But if we are restoring land, we are not doing that just because of the carbon. That's, that's, that's the only thing. But why we are doing that, and I will put this slide here, is we are doing this, of course, carbon is one part, but you, we are also doing this because we want to have better jobs, permanent jobs, decent jobs. Um, we, have, we would like to have clean water. We would, would like to have food security, ecotourism, um, even fuel good, you know, we need we need to produce, uh, we need to cook, and we need to cook in a sustainable way. Of course, you know there are clean energies, but there are some cultures that like fire because fire is a purif to, to purify your uh, your spirit and and it's connected. So you need to cook with fire. So that's part of the of the of the of the vision of of some communities. But there is a way that we can do that without harming the environment, without harming other people. And that's the balance that we need to find. So we are doing restriction, carbon is one piece, but it, there are many other areas. And how we do that? Of course, there are many ways to do that. But the one uh, is, of course, uh, protecting the forest. When we talk about ecosystem restriction, uh, and you say conservation is not that. Conservation is not restriction, but I would argue that if you don't conserve what is in your landscape, you are not really talking about restoration because you need to keep what is protected, what you have protected instead of just restoring. And then if not, it's like cleaning uh, and then putting trash behind you. You know, you are cleaning in front of you, but you're leaving trash behind of you. So you are not doing basically anything. The balance might be zero, but it does not what we are looking into here. And also, you know, the, we need to look at the agriculture. You know, we produce a lot of food. Uh, we eat a lot of that same food every day. We need to work with, with farmers, you know, to, to see how we can better, and, and that's different ways to restore. One last thing, we also need to think about the, the not everything is about forests. We have peatlands, you know, we have peatlands where we have, uh, we don't I mean, we need to restore them and that doesn't mean to plant trees. Uh, and we have other ecosystems like natural grasslands where we don't have to plant trees. So. Ecosystem restoration is also a variety of activities with don't involve only the planting of the trees. So that's the other thing that I would like to share. And just to finalize uh, the, the talk is, um, you know, we have developed, and this I wanna share this with you. You wanna learn more about, you know, the connection between the science and, and, and restoration. We have developed a series of courses online you can download them and look at it in your computer if you have bad internet, for example, or you can take it online. Those are free. Those were done with FAO in collaboration with FAO. It's the FAO eLearning Academy. There are tons of courses there that you can look into, um, but there are three that are on landscape restoration if you want to take a look. And, and I am sure the organizer will share this presentation with you with the link. Um, um, and yeah, very happy to be here. And I hope this has been a good return on investment of your time. Thank you very much. Thanks, Erin. Back to you. Great, thank you so much, Renee. Um, if you could, great. So now um, I'm going to ask all of the speakers um, to, that have spoken so far to join us. So I'm bringing back um, John as well. And we have a couple of questions from the, the chat. So I wanted to share a couple of those with you. Um, John, I'll start with you. Um, and one of, one of the questions that, that comes up frequently is how to deal or how to include or prioritize um, different types of activities in different places. Um, 
there's a whole range of practices. And within the camps movement, I think we've seen an interesting um, approach to let um, the people in the landscape identify what those priorities are. Um, so could you talk a little bit about um, what that is looking like in, in some of the places that um, are part of the network? And then Renee, um, so you can prepare your answer as well. Um, we have two questions from the group that are um, a, a bit more technical in nature. One is um, about the use of biochar as a potential strategy, um, as well as agroforestry. Um, I think some of the strategies that you mentioned there fit in closely with agroforestry and kind of maybe help the group understand a little bit about what those practices might look like on, on productive lands. Um, and you also mentioned the AFR 100 work with restoration in Africa. Um, could you help us understand what opportunities there are for restoration type activities in North Africa? Um, as that's an area or region that sometimes isn't identified as a, as a priority um, region. Um, some, one of our listeners would like to understand more about what possibilities are available there. So first I'll pass it over to John. Okay. Well, um, priorities. Um, I would say that the permaculture principle of observation is a really, really important one. And that the local people are the ones who actually know what's going on when there's subtle changes in temperature, wind direction, wind speed, rainfall, or available moisture. It's always the local people who know much more than anyone else about this. Even if you are studying it from a satellite image perspective, you, you, you don't really have the same level of, of uh, sort of um, density that you, you do if, you, if it's raining on you, if you know the temperature. So um, I think that observation is, is very important. And I think it's really important to understand that some of these concepts, while they are extremely complex, it doesn't mean that they can't be understood. Um, I think what I've noticed in, in the last few decades in terms of what I've observed in degraded landscapes, in functional landscapes, and in restored or restoring landscapes is that the moisture needs to be held near the surface of the earth. If, the, if, if we've altered the surface and we cause thermic drafts that drive the moisture into the upper atmosphere, then this is going to have a much more impactful greenhouse effect than even CO2. It's twice as impactful and twice as, as, as big as CO2 as a greenhouse gas. So high altitude moisture that is unnecessary and that is being pushed there because of human impacts, who can change that? The people in villages can change this. What is the value of changing this? It's enormous. This is where the, the support from the United Nations and other, other groups should go. It should go directly to the people who have the ability to understand and to do this. And it should not just go into swirling pots of consultants somewhere. It should go to people who, whose lives depend on this and also who have the ability to do this work. And in doing this are not only helping themselves, they're helping themselves, their families, their communities, their countries, humanity as a whole and future generations of life of all types. So, the priorities are, 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 are quite clear to me that we have to observe and we have to understand that there is really a hierarchy of functionality. So one of the aspects is water, moisture, availability and cycling of this moisture. And another, another one which I think is critically important is the, is the fertility 
in the soil. We used to dance around the fire and, and you know, have fertility dances or something. We should do this again because we need to, we, we need to realize that this is changing and that evolutionary succession is what I have been studying. And what I've noticed is that when the, the evolutionary succession has principles, so studying those principles and understanding those principles, always more biodiversity, always more biomass, always more accumulated organic matter. These principles are the basis of the systems that we're, we're relying on for life support. So if we all know that and we all work to do this and we, and we value that ourselves and the rest of the society and civilization values that, then we must support the people who do this work because there's nothing more important than that. So this is, I think, where we, and then, and then at the other side of this, we, we need the lowest cost and the highest effectiveness at, at response. And that seems to be engaging as many people as possible in directly restoring ecological function. And when they understand it, when they're not asking permission, when they're not, they don't need to have somebody tell them what to do because they understand what they're doing. Then they get up in the morning and they do what needs to be done and they, and they, they are effective at it. That's what I think is, is the priority for us. Thanks so much, John. I think that really resonates with my experience in the, in the organization as well, um, that we've really grown as an organization by recognizing the existing work that's already going on and the individuals and initiatives that have already started this process of re restoration activities um, who have already found that motivation and, and way of organizing themselves and for, for us to support those activities um, through our network and community um, and through individuals who are able to support um, those projects as well. So uh, thank you for those comments and for thinking about how we can consider some of these priorities at the, um, at the macro level as well. Um, Renee, um, I would welcome you to respond to, to any comments that you'd like to make um, and specifically the, the questions that I mentioned before. Yeah, no, thanks, Erin. I, I make a note here. And um, so thanks for the question. So there are biochar. You know, biochar is um, um, one of these products that um, for, for those that might not be familiar with, uh, you can um, basically um, take any biomass and, and do some uh, pyrolysis effect, you know, you burn that at very high temperatures and then you concentrate the carbon in, in, in particles in let's say the ashes no, that, that are remaining on, on that process. And then you can use that to uh, work with soils, you know, to, to restore fertility of soils that have lost that fertility or, or compensate some, some, some variables of uh, acidity and other components. So that, that there is a potential, there is research ongoing right now uh, you can see both sides of the questions. There are some people that said that this might be an incentive to um, probably um, burn more biomass uh, to produce this product. There are some other groups that are saying that this is a good way to, to really take uh, all the, the biomass that you cannot convert into products, let's say timber and others, and then you can process that and then use that for soil amendments. Um, so there are two areas in the spectrum. I think there is some ongoing research right now. Um, there are some experiences where this product has been applied and the soils have been restored, um, some fertility. There are some areas where there is no effect. So I think uh, um, uh, I think there is an ongoing discussion, and I I, I would recommend you know just to be um, um, to assess you know the different options because there is not a, a right answer for that product, but it's it, it's something that is in there. In terms of agroforestry, agroforestry, of course, you know, that's promising. And, and also there are research in, in different areas. There are research that when you have trees with, with, with cows, for example, you can improve uh, the production of milk and beef of those cows by having more trees in your property. 
Um, but of course, you know, um, you know, there are also um, crops with uh, with trees like coffee with trees. That is very uh, a very good example in, in Latin America. At least, you know, we like, actually in Salvador, the forest cover they have in great part is because they have these coffee tree plant tree shape uh, coffee plantations. So this is very promising. But again, you know, the problem is not we don't we cannot apply them in every situation. There are conditions, you know, we need, as, as John was saying, we need to restore some conditions before we do any practice. And if you have limitations of soil, if the soil is very degraded or is, if the water is not there, then uh, any of these options might not work. In, in terms of the last question on FR100, um, of course, you know, that when this movement started with the bond challenge, it was called forest landscape restoration. So it, has, it had the forest as a last name or as a first name. Uh, right now, it has evolved more uh, ecosystem restoration, which doesn't mean only tree tree based restoration. So there are some opportunities for countries that are that have you know less less forest area because of the conditions, the, the ecosystems that are there. But they have ecosystems that are important to be restored. And the importance of FR100 is that it's a country led initiative. So if a country decides, you know, this is what we would like to restore with our people, uh, I think there are a diverse uh, way of ecosystems that doesn't necessarily have trees in there, but that are very important for people. And, and, and I think they, they, they could be considered. Just an example from, from my the initiative that I support, which is 20 by 20, we have the case of Uruguay, where they have these natural grasslands and they are not looking into, into trees. They are looking into how we restore these grasslands that are there. Uh, but no planting trees, but all. And, and their commitment is restoring that type of ecosystem. In case of Peru and, and Chile, they are uh, looking into the wetlands, especially the wetlands in highlands, how we can restore them because they were drained, you know, the wetlands, they were drained for agriculture, but now they are looking into, you know, how we can restore that. And that's, that doesn't mean planting trees. It's, it's a different approach. So I think every, every um, country and every uh, area has their own, objectives that uh, can be applied for ecosystem as a whole. Uh, I would say that, thanks, uh, back to you. Thank you so much, Renee. It's really inspiring to see the communities and of practice and leadership that the 20 by 20 initiative has developed across Latin America to really pull together leaders in restoration practice and science and to make sure that those communities are informing national policies and also achieving work on the ground. So um, we're really excited to see what will continue to come out of um, the 20 by 20 initiative, initiative for 20 by 20, as well as um, we're really thankful to have your background and experience in it to inform this conversation as well. So thank you for taking the time to join us. And John, thank you for your inspiration and, and observations about where we can go um, with this restoration work. Um, we had one additional comment in the question in the chat um, from Plant for the Planet related to ecosystem restoration camps and how we monitor um, our impact. Um, as an organization, we've been developing a prototype and a, a repetitive process of learning um, in a framework that we call our souls, uh, soil, souls and society framework, where we look at three major areas of impact for each um, site. And you can find more about that um, on our website at ecosystemrestorationcamps.org. So I think with that, we will conclude the question and answer section. Um, and we'll go to a brief break before introducing our future speakers. Um, if you want, if you have other questions um, as the conversation develops, um, please feel free to stick around. Um, we'll have a, an open discussion at the end as well. So if um, additional com com conversations or comments um, come up, um, they'll be welcome. So thank you so much, Renee and John. Thank you, thank you. So now we'll go um, to a brief break for five minutes and we will resume shortly.
Hi, everyone. This is a verbal reminder that we'll be back in one minute for the second part of our presentation. Hi, everyone. We're coming back for the second part of our presentation. And I'm pleased to introduce our next guest speaker. In this second round, we'll have um, three speakers who are each leading restoration activities at different sites around the world. We will also open space for questions at the end of the three presentations. So um, up first, we have Geneva Sorensen. Geneva is the Camp Paradise and Campfire Restoration Project Director in the United States in California. Welcome, Geneva. Um, please make sure you are unmuted and um, feel free to share your screen as well. Okay, then. Let's see. We on? Yes. Okay. Good morning, uh, maybe afternoon or evening, everyone. Um, my name is Geneva Sorensen, and I'm the director of the Campfire Restoration Project. And uh, I'm calling in from Machupta Maidu territory, which is known as uh, Paradise, California in the United States. And um, I just wanna acknowledge the original tenders and stewards of this land, um, the Maidu people that um, were the original earth stewards and restoration leaders. And um, so grateful for all of their thousands of years of work and knowledge that brought us to the landscape that we have today. Um, and as Erin said, I'm with the Campfire Restoration Project. Um, our vision is to joyfully cultivate harmony with humanity through nature. And our mission is to demonstrate regenerative community and inspire our new human story. Um, and Campfire Restoration Project in ecosystem restoration camps is known as Camp Paradise. So you can find us as Camp Paradise on the website there. And our organization was started shortly after the 2018 campfire, which is the deadliest and the most destructive wildfire in California history. And um, this talk is sort of um, appropriately timed in terms of just yesterday was the three year anniversary of the fire. And um, so the loss and the impact of, of um, that mega fire is still very present in our community and it's still being felt. Um, and so I just wanna just give a quick nod and acknowledgement to all of those fire survivors and the new and continued fire survivors that we have here in California. Um, and our project was, um, I mean, here in Butte County, we've been impacted by the campfire, but then since then, and you know, last year we had 
the bear fire and this current fire season, we've had the Dixie fire. And so mega fires are a constant in our community. Also, I'm in a yurt with rain, so hopefully it's not too distracting. <laughs> um, and, you know, we see the direct impacts. I mean, I am not an expert. I am not a, a trained restoration expert. Um, I just want to qualify that in the beginning. I consider myself a normal human being. Um, but having grown up in this area and noticing the changes in the um, in the rain, we are getting great rain now. Um, but historically, for the last 10 years, we've been in a pretty extreme drought. You know, we've seen friends and families' wells go dry that have not been dry. Um, and we have these mega fires, which of course are not just climate change. As Renee mentioned, many of these things are very layered. Um, but certainly, when you have a forest that hasn't been able to um, receive water or hard pack unhealthy soil that's not able to soak in water, uh, that it in increases the uh, flammability of that, right? And then since having fire, all of those roots that hold our soil together, we have increased erosion. We have a massive landslide um, on one of our main highways just after this recent rainstorm. And that was an area impacted by the Dixie fire. So um, it's very easy to see the effects of climate change in our, just our small community here. Um, and, and being able to tend this land after the fire is really what inspired the start of this project. Um, and over the last several years of organization, we've kind of developed a, an approach. Um, and that is to one, focus on relationships. Um, being a community that's been impacted by so many um, great challenges, in addition to loss of loss from, from wildfires, but also as many of you all know from COVID and um, it's kind of been a stacked uh, issue. And so we don't really have the capacity to do things alone. You know, it's sort of a requirement for us to collaborate with each other for us to have the capacity and the resources to do the work that we need to do. And so it's sort of been a silver lining of um, going through a traumatic event, um, but building our relationships, having a collaborative approach, both with local community members and from the top, you know, and larger government uh, organizations. Um, the other piece that we are, and that also is about healing our relationships, um, just to jump back with the land and um, we truly believe that the more that you have a relationship with something, the more likely you're going to protect it. And so as we rebuild our relationship with this land, we learn from um, the indigenous practitioners here about how to be in better relationship with our plant relatives and our animal relatives and our, um, our land, then that can help us be better stewards and um, have a deeper relationship to know how to protect and steward this land. So then that leads us to education and that's um, historically we did camps, big camps like John was talking about, uh, where we could invite lots of people to come and take action and restoring the burn scar. COVID allowed us to, uh, like many of us, revamp and revise and adapt. Um, and so we did more local focused uh, educational workshops. And, you know, the goal is really to try to support local community members that are not experts necessarily to learn practical skills on how to be in better relationship with their land, how to capture and slow down water, how to build soil, um, giving them resources to, to plant. So that goes down to resources. We have given away trees, we have um, given away uh, soil and different restoration related materials and wood chips. Um, we also have created video content, um, and we'll show some pictures of that, but being able to provide resources for the community and then sharing models, you know, sharing the model of collaboration, um, sharing the model of permaculture, sharing the models of traditional ecological knowledge or TEK, um, and being able to demonstrate how those can be put into place and um, demonstrating a different way to be in relationship with this land. 
And so some of the ways that we have done this, um, and I also just want to name that I have an incredible team of, of folks that support me all the time on this. So even though it's my face you're seeing, none of this could be done without um, a group of very dedicated, passionate individuals. Um, and so I just want to name, name them. Um, but in the last year, we were able to plant or give away um, almost 4,000 trees in the burn scar covering over 550 properties. Those properties are not only private properties, but in some of these pictures, we're planting fruit trees at a school where they had a fruit tree orchard um, that got burned in the fire. Those students get to learn about and tend those trees. Um, another one is a, on the bottom picture is at a community church, which was a memorial grove, planting fruit trees there where there's still fire survivors camped there in RVs living um, and being able to provide access to food. Um, and then also we gave away hardwood trees, which are fit for this landscape that are fire resilient and fire adapted um, because this is a fire ecology that we live in. And so trying to educate and learn how to be in relationship with that um, as opposed to fight it, you know, it's working with our existing landscape and supporting it so that it continues to support us. Um, after the campfire, one of our first responses was uh, distributing wattles or compost socks, which are these long snake tubey things. Um, the idea is that they stop sediment, they help prevent erosion, but also when you, they prevent toxic runoff from burned buildings or workshops from leaching and running into waterways. And so we were able to distribute those after the campfire. Um, and then through our work with different uh, government and local organizations, we were able to do that again for bear fire survivors. And actually the California Office of Emergency Services um, learned from the campfire and from some of our responses with other environmental groups uh, to do this for the bear fire. So they actually provided some of these in addition to these ones that we were able to provide. So it's sort of um, encouraging to see the actions that we're taking be carried on for future learning um, because none of us have been here before and none of us have dealt with this before. So it really takes uh, tracking and learning and trying and working together to try to do the best we can as things continue to be unprecedented. <laughs> um, and some of the other workshops that we've put on is we've done educational videos online. We have a, a YouTube channel. We have a website. We installed the first permitted gray water system in paradise. Again, teaching, you know, individuals how that they can do uh, climate action on their property by reserving the water, you know, keeping the water on their property. Um, we've also been holding traditional ecological plant walks with a um, traditional, traditional ecological pra master practitioner, Ali Metters Knight. Um, where again, we're learning about the keystone species. We're building our relationship with our um, other than human world. And then again, holding uh, restoration camps in the fall and fruits fall and spring of 2019. Um, and we do continue to hope to open that back up. Um, but really it's just uh, inspiring the, the everyday person um, on how to, how to be a better earth steward. And that doesn't have to necessarily be getting your hands in the dirt, right? It's a lot of these businesses or corporations that are um, causing a lot of destruction in our ecosystem are being fueled by the consumer that drives them. And so, as the individual, there's so many actions we can take in how we buy and how we shop or how we save our water or how we use our resources or how we share with our neighbors or how we collaborate with other people in our, in our community. Um, and I feel like all of that actually is related to ecosystem restoration. Um, and so it's been an inspiring journey and a humbling journey. And, um, yeah, I'm so grateful to be representing us and thank you so much. <laughs> thank you, Geneva. It, it sounds like we'll have a little bit of background noise. Um, so I'll go directly to the next speaker. Um, Maximilian Abulesh Bose. He is the Chief Sustainable Development Officer at Camp Seca. 
in Egypt. Thank you for joining us, Max. Thank you very much for the introduction. I'm very, very happy to be part of this movement and I'm very happy that I can share some of our experiences um, here from Egypt. I, 12 years ago, only from Germany, but uh, I have become uh, an Egyptian so far. Uh, I will share the screen. So, Egypt is maybe not uh, the first country that comes into your mind for ecosystem restoration. It has vast desert areas, but lending to a story from John also, this maybe it wasn't all the time the case. So we are believing that even in the most harsh conditions, we have to um, start acting. And um, the main reason to develop um, ecosystems and restore desert land is also to uh, drive a transformation of society and build communities. Uh, and have the uh, agriculture uh, ecological side as a basis. This initiative was founded 43 years ago by Ibrahim Aboulaish. And the vision was um, to build or to, to foster sustainable development uh, where human beings can uh, unfold their potential, where mankind is living in social forms that reflect human dignity and where economic activities are woven in according to economic, uh, ecological and ethical principles. So we see here a very holistic vision um, that, that was formulated and seeded in the ground. And it was definitely a mission impossible when Ibrahim started to dig the first well in the desert. But it is this kind of momentum that should uh, inspire uh, other people to, to engage also in mission impossibles. When Ibrahim left us, in 2017, as a community, we kind of reconnected back to our vision and to the fourfoldness and formulated vision goals for the next 40 years that also spring out the four dimensions of life. And um, I will not go into all of them, but it shows how much related uh, every sphere of life is to community building and ecosystem restoration. There is an, not only an ecological um, functions, but also an institutional ecosystem that grew organically over the last 43 years. And I want to highlight this slide to show you where the Camp Sikkim is embedded in. It's an institutional ecosystem made by human, by, by, by yeah, in the social sphere, let's say, combining um, different uh, combining ele elements and institutions that serve all spheres of life. Um, we have uh, an SACM holding company um, that encompasses different um, uh, companies that are engaged in ecosystem or land reclamation, are engaged in um, processing of herbs and spices, are engaged in uh, food production, textile production, uh, phytopharmaceutical production. And this value creation um, is also uh, mainly used in, uh, in educational uh, and human uh, development activities. And for that reason, there are several, um, and, uh, several NGOs that have been founded. An NGO that um, is taking care of a school, a kindergarten, a nursery, and a medical center, and is building spring offs in all over Egypt and also just yesterday, a new um, kindergarten has been uh, opened up in our Camp Sikkim that is located in the Western Desert following the model of the original, uh, yeah, original farm. Um, so we are really in the process of replicating uh, our model and trying to understand better the mechanics of it. Um, to help to do this, a lot of research is needed and a lot of education is needed and um, thereby, uh, in 2012, uh, Heliopolis University for Sustainable Development was founded. Um, and this was a, a, a key piece to the, to 
the puzzle of this uh, vision to be able to um, to weave in research and uh, education and to serve community development. Uh, and this year, there are also certain um, uh, societal functions, uh, legal entities that have been created that ensure the institutional sustainability of SICM, which essentially um, owns itself in a form of a trust and where um, a kind of statutes uh, permitiate the uh, using of excessive funds into community building and into ecosystem restoration. And with the help of a lot of SICM friends all over the world, this could have been made possible. Uh, these are just some, some key numbers um, to show you where we are. And it might seem overwhelming, um, uh, especially maybe for camps who started in recently, but it shows also the beauty of the diversity of the different camps and that there's a lot that we can learn from each other. Um, I will start with the green um, cells, which show that we have at the moment um, almost 300 hectares that we are operating ourselves, but the majority of raw materials for the value creation come from the hectares, um, 1,355 uh, hectares from our farmers that are all over Egypt, small scale farmers that have a long standing relationship with us and who all apply biodynamic uh, agriculture principles and deliver to us raw materials. On our own farms, we're using a lot of water, as you can see, 4 million cubic meters of water per year. And this is a slide on 2020. Um, and uh, we managed to uh, grow different uh, crops and also uh, plant a lot of trees. Um, our aim is uh, to plant 1 million trees by 2027. And I have John's words in my ears saying it's not all about tree planting. And that's correct. We know that it is a kind of integrated part of restoring um, soil fertility and inviting other species to, uh, to live uh, and provide services to the agricultural um, so, uh, yeah, picture, to the farm. And they are a great um, source for carbon sequestration, which essentially um, is, is, is providing additional financial means that can support farmers in this important transition. Um, we see that farmers are getting more and more competitive in applying biodynamic principles, given the rising energy cost in the world and given additional uh, funds such as uh, carbon uh, credits that we can generate, not only from trees, but also from soil, um, where a lot of carbon can be stored and from compost making, where a lot of emissions and methane and gas uh, can be avoided. And also from applying photovoltaic energy uh, instead of uh, off-grid diesel generators. And it's all part of a story where we can say in the end, our uh, initiative is carbon positive. We, are sec we sequestered around 6,000 tons of, of CO2 in, in 2020. And we emitted with all our activities and economic life, um, 4,000 uh, tons roughly. So there's a net benefit. And I know that carbon is not the whole story and it's a very intellectual approach, but it is also talking the language of, of the uh, policy makers and of businesses that allow us to, um, to maneuver in this kind of um, still very strong uh, capitalistic oriented society and to provide a model that can you know, bridge the two worlds. Um, with this raw materials, we are creating uh, a lot of um, sales um, which are used for um, educational um, activities and uh, a good share of it also goes to the export. But very luckily, we developed also a local market that is uh, emphasizing on organic and reg regenerative agricultural practices. Um, so in the end, we are very proud to say that Sikkim holding in its core is an initiative for human development. So that means we are proud to say that more than 100 small children get educated in our nursery and our kindergarten. And for uh, special needs, we have a place to educate them. And 
and we have uh, around 500 uh, pupils that are visiting our schools and our vocational training center. And it is those vocational training centers that are building up our photovoltaic um, assets in the, in the farms together with the students. And after only four years, we could almost engage 3000 students in five faculties. So there, there are a lot of mechanisms where we are able to provide a, a pilot um, and trying to find models to scale them up and spread them in Egypt and into the world. These are some pictures of ecosystem restoration in the middle of our camp Sikkim in Wahat Desert, in the, in the Western Egyptian desert, where we experiment with different types of irrigation. And yes, we are taking in that case also, excuse me, and yes, we are taking in that case also water from the ground, which has fossil origin, but we are aware of this challenge and we have roughly 100 years to find out mechanisms to scale greening the desert efforts in such a way so we can restore ecological cycles. So sustainable development for us means really to manage and cope with trade-offs because in reality, you always have to balance out um, different uh, different impacts and for us building a model where um, community uh, building and sustainable development and ecosystem restoration is done is very important uh, economic activities are an integrated part of our value creation and it's super important to create a healthy economic life that creates value locally where funds can be generated to stay economically autark and to have the funds to develop and serve community needs. Educational efforts are, as I said, at the core of our model. And um, there is such a high need for transforming the educational uh, sector. I cannot even emphasize strongly enough. And uh, we just opened up a community school next to the kindergarten on our new farm in uh, the Wahad Desert. And it's amazing what, what kind of, what can be created out of nothing, just by starting it and then improving it internally with the help of people. And together we are, we are, we are yeah, also depend on more than 1,500 people from our communities that come from the surrounding villages to seek a network together. And it combines farmers, professors, managers, um, workers uh, from all over Egypt and around the world to achieve this. And I also want to say thank you for listening and thank you also to giving me the opportunity to share this. Thank you so much, Max. So we just heard from Max, who's working with SECAM, and I think he really importantly touched on the institutionality, um, the, the structures and ways that we organize our work to be successful over time. And we're so pleased to have, to count SECAM as a partner in this network. Um, they've been a leader in the region and globally on dry land restoration for over four decades. And seeing that work evolve and succeed is something that can be really helpful um, to other members in, the, in our community as well. So thank you so much for your, for your comments. And um, you. I also wanted to come back as well to our pre presentation from Geneva and just mention how important um, the community building and outreach and the looking for opportunities to build those relationships with the landscape is for the success of, of um, her work in a fire affected landscape. Um, at, before we move on to Yasmin, I want to remind folks who are listening to us, um, we'll do a round of question and answer. So if you have questions for Geneva, Max or Yasmin, please, um, add them in the YouTube chat. We see some coming through and we'll um, bring that into our conversation um, at the end of the presentations. 
So next I'd like to introduce Yasmin Mahamoud. She is the Managing Director at Dryland Solutions in Somalia. And we're very pleased to have you here, Yasmin. Uh, thank you so much. And it's humbling to be here. So thank you for allowing me to participate in this program. Uh, I just wanted to work. share my screen with you, just to give me a second. I'm working on it. Okay. Um, I think I need help with the with my presentation. Great. I think we can um, share our screen, Yasmin, and and you'll be able to continue your presentation. So just give us one moment while we pull that up. Oh, uh, is that mine? Okay, perfect. Here we go. Yep. Okay, can you make it full screen? Okay, awesome. Yep, all set, go ahead. Um, again, thank you so much uh, uh, for allowing me to be here and it's great. Um, it's really great to be a part of the ERC movement and without it, I wouldn't be able to do what I'm, uh, what I, what I, what I'm doing right now. So thank you. So uh, my name again is Yasmin, uh, Managing Director of Dryland Solutions. And I would like to introduce you to the work that we're doing um, in Somalia uh, right now to establish our first camp, which will form the nexus of ecosystem restoration work in the Nugal region of Somalia. Um, I established Dryland Solutions in 2019. Uh, because when I first traveled back to Somalia, one thing that became very clear uh, immediately was the connection between damaged environment and human poverty. I felt that I needed to do something and I established. So I established a community-led organization in order to support the work of ecosystem restoration in Somalia and to be a part of the work of the international movement to change the climate change story that we are in from a disaster and catastrophe to one of transformation. Dryland Solutions strives to improve the lives of rural communities, uh, including uh, the internally displaced uh, personnel, uh, women, youth, uh, in addressing key poverty and environmental concerns. We're working with the ecosystem restoration camps and other partners to empower the community through education, examples, and a lot of inspirations. Camps will be a knowledge hub where knowledge can be shared and de demonstrated and a place where people can come together and communities are strengthened and built. This will show what is possible in the local and global context and help Somalia tackle current crisis in range of fronts, but especially in food and water security. Uh, slide two, please. Uh, slide two. Perfect, yes. Uh, yes. <laughs> um, so we, are, we understand that uh, to grow, we understand that to grow and strive, Somalia must first look to heal and repair and restore within. We're looking to uh, reverse ecological damage and create resilient environment and social systems for a better future. Dryland Solutions embraces the core permaculture ethics of planet care, people care, and fair share. But we like to kind of twist that uh, ethics and start with people care. Uh, because without, if we get uh, the people part right, everything else uh, will work um, uh, itself out. Restoring uh, the ecosystems of the region will form a foundation for a strong, resilient growth. Uh, next slide, please. Slide three. Okay, thank you. Uh, we're operating our base in Garowe, which is northeastern part of Somalia. We are in the process of establishing ecosystem restoration camp that can be a beacon of hope for resilience in this, in this region. 
We're working closely with the locals and our partners to develop holistic plans for land and people. The camp will serve as an example of the ways in which degraded landscapes of the region can be restored. This also brings many benefits in terms of climate change mitigation and adaptation, halting and reversal of biodiversity losses, uh, addressing food and water security, social cohesion, conflict resolution, in, uh, equality, community building, and economic prosperity. By bringing nature and, and society together and thinking holistically, we can dramatically increase resilience and forge a better and more sustainable future in the region. Uh, slide four, challenges. The urgent need for ecosystem restoration is clear. People here live on the very front line of climate change, and it's not some abstract reality. In their day-to-day -day lives, they feel the effect of climate change and the certification in a very real, immediate, and tangible ways. People are living at the age of life and death. Drought is a defining feature of Somalia. It, its impact can be distressing and affecting the whole community. This is the only place in the world, maybe one of the places in the world where drought causes famine and despair very often. Somali nomad, nomads are recognizing rain, rainfall regimes has changed drastically and know that their climate has become unpredictable, but they remain at the mercy of nature. And these people have done nothing to contribute to climate change crisis. Communities uh, used to depend on their animals for milk, ghee, and meat can no longer get those essentials because the livestock um, needs to go farther and farther away uh, to find grassland and water. The local medicinal plants and wild fruits from native forests are harder to find and some areas disappearing entirely due to climate change again. So as a community, uh, we have, we, uh, as a human, I guess, uh, we have to explore other avenues of livelihood security beyond handouts. So human activities is a, it's a, it's a part of it as well. Uh, overgrazing has damaged uh, and degraded natural ecosystems of the region, which led to widespread defragmentation uh, and deforestation. Um, so the political turmoil since uh, Somali central government collapsed in 1991 means that uh, vacuum of power and people reverted to traditional and religious law to govern the um, and resolve clan conflicts. These things have made it challenging to form a cohesive response to the environmental problem. Ecosystem restoration is, is key in tackling all these challenges. We have uh, slide five. We have, uh, we now, we know uh, now that establishing ecosystem restoration camp in Somalia will be the first key landmark, a step in forging a better future. The road has been challenging and we are making great progress toward this primary goal. We signed a memorandum of understanding with the Budland government, which is the local government in which they agreed to sign a land into the care of dry land solutions for next 30 years. We have also taken the steps to actually force progress on this by, by hoping to sign another uh, memorandum of understanding with our partners who are providing support in getting the government to sign uh, over the land previously discussed. We're confident that we can soon finalize the land allotment and establish the camp. With the presence on the ground, it will be easy to engage local communities, village elders, the young people, the women the ecosystem in the ecosystem restoration. Uh, this camp, once it shows results, can be easily replicated in more communities, engaging more and more people, reaching larger scale. Directly engaging the people with education and practical experience allows for self-directed, self-replicating restoration activities. The most exciting piece of progress is that we have just con concluded our first permaculture course. Slide six, please. 
Awesome. Um, yes, to train the trainers who will go on to teach the local and international volunteers at ecosystem restoration. We are excited to establish and run the first, uh, the, uh, to run Somali's first ever permaculture course. BTC instructor Anton Bernadou, co-founder uh, of Enaya Permaculture, instructed students in training of trainers program in permaculture design during a two week intensive course. 70% of, of the participants training of the trainers uh, of BTC course came from local universities and had degrees and experience uh, in the climate change and agriculture. We aimed 50% of the students to be women. However, uh, some females have dropped out of class last minute, just because I think um, uh, women do uh, and, and, and girls do bear more responsibilities in, in, in helping uh, their families. Slide seven, please. Yeah, seven. Okay, awesome. Okay. Um, we have been ex uh, extremely encouraged by the feedback students have provided us on this course. Permaculture training was very successful. All the students said that tr uh, the training got, uh, they got from the BTC course is better than the four years university program at the local universities. The students were very happy to learn and cover the principles and ethics of permaculture and be able to read landscapes learn how to heal soil, how to design integrated systems, how to best harvest rainwater, how to build drought-proof land, and, and build and create healthy soil, sequester carbon, and learn many ways to make compost. Number eight, um, so slide eight. We're very excited to have our participants go on and spread what they have learned and put into practice for a better future for themselves and their community. Thank you. I'm so grateful for all of you. Um, I'm so grateful for all the people who made this possible. I couldn't have done it by myself without the ERC team, uh, without the many people who really uh, supported uh, and, and made it possible. Um, and even the, our funders that allowed us to uh, make our first uh, BTC course in Somalia. Thank you. Thank you so much, Yasmin. I'm gonna ask you to stay on the screen for a moment as well. It's really been inspiring to see the work you've been doing um, in your community and for also sharing with this group a bit more about how climate impacts are affecting the landscape and what that means for people and communities. I'm going to also um, now add in our other speakers and we'll move into our question and answer section of our event. Um, I know that some, our, we were originally scheduled to end our, um, our presentation now, but as, since we have such interesting questions coming in, um, we'll go ahead and extend our event for another 10 to 15 minutes. Um, and as long as the speakers are able to join us, we'll, we'll keep um, addressing questions as they come in through the YouTube chat. Um, I'm adding in Max as well as Geneva. Great. Thank you all. Um, it's always such a joy for me to hear what's going on at at different camps around the world and to see the leadership and commitment um, that you each have to your place, to your landscape, um, through all of the, the challenges and the successes that come in committing to these type, this type of work um, and then seeing it through to success. So it's always a privilege for me to hear um, from, from each of you and that work. And um, I'll open the conversation with one question that came in for Geneva, but I want to pose it to all of our speakers and then I'll go into some additional questions. 
Um, and the, the question that they have um, that was posed, um, and I'll pose it to the group, is what else do you need to be successful in the work that you're doing? Um, you've already set forward in this path, um, in each of your environments, in each of your challenging contexts, um, and you've seen ways to be successful in doing that. Um, and certainly through ecosystem restoration camps, there are opportunities um, to be connected to other projects and to build that community of practice. Um, but I'd like to open the question um, to each of the camp leads, leads here about um, what they see specifically um, for their project uh, to be, um, to continue um, that success and to grow. Um, Geneva, we'll go ahead and, and start with you. Sorry, I have a co-presenting cat here um, that's very interested in helping talk about this. Um, I think, you know, there is, there's always need. I think money is, is typically a limiting factor um, to just say it bluntly. And then I think uh, we are, it's, it's interesting, it's enjoyable to listen to Max talk because I feel like our project, you know, was sort of started out of this immediate disaster response. Um, and like many people in our community, you sort of just run on adrenaline almost in terms of like what, what you need to have done. And we are in a process as an organization to figure out how we can institutionalize these things to make it sustainable so that we can continue doing this. And so there is the, um, the joy of getting, for me, it's getting dirty and getting, you know, outside. That's what, you know, lights me up. But um, then also sort of that back end administration stuff, which can get laborious. And of course, you don't want it too bureaucratic, but, but also there's some necessary um, requirements for your project to maintain um, success and sustainability. And so we're sort of in that transition phase in terms of organizational planning and institutionalizing and creating a sustainability plan. So, I mean, it could be administrative support. Um, with COVID, we've been limiting kind of volunteers from out to come into the community just for safety reasons or uh, health precautions. But um, yeah, fundraising, a dedicated group of team members or people that we can pay to kind of keep us, you know, going on instead of running, you know, sort of in response mode, but maybe more in a planned mode. Um, and so, yeah, I think those are kind of the, the main things. And then, you know, certainly reach out and let us know what you got to offer. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'll, I'll leave it with that so others can answer. Max, we'd love to hear from you about um, where, what SECA needs after um, so many decades of learning, um, where, where do you wanna go next? So I would say the, the key um, for further development and also where um, things are always um, challenging is that you get the right people on board. You, you always have um, the need to getting people who are able to um, engage in a role uh, that requires always a transformative mission of taking responsibility for something that is not there. So it's, it's really radical responsibility. It's an openness to a, a different culture where you have to maneuver without probably language um, advantage. Arabic uh, is of course very helpful. Um, and I would say you need, what, what I would precisely ask for is also people who come in with a spe specific expertise in the field of organic and biodynamic agriculture um, and um, who can really go uh, into the field and, and take responsibility for operational stuff and are able to um, um, stay a year or longer because you cannot do something below that. And, uh, and, and we, need, we need also to be open to say, yeah, we would appreciate if it's, if it's on a needs-based um, um, compensation. Um, 
you know, making a lot of sales doesn't mean that there's a lot of cash. In the contrary, um, we have seen that, you know, taking private depth is not the, the best idea to, to, to green the desert. So there's always a shortage of, 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 of cash. So you will not enter a kind of initiative with the aim of making money, but with the aim of sharing experience, learning, being open, and just giving it all and take initiative. So these kind of people are, I think, the most valuable thing that can happen to an initiative. Thank you, Max. And I think that phrase that you used about radical responsibility is something that we can all integrate into the work that we're doing, um, whether we have a land-based project or we want to get involved in one. Thank you. Yasmin. Oh, my goodness. Okay, I'll try to um, answer this question. I think, you know, obviously I'm in a different place and uh, both of you um, with regards to, I'm in a place where we're coming out and recovering from almost 30 years of, uh, you know, type of civil war. Um, so in a, some, it, there's a lot of challenge. Yeah. Um, so I think what we need a support, I feel like sometimes it's like when you first finish uh, university and you need that first company to give you a chance to actually see what you're able to do so yeah you know one is you know you know creating that network and and and, and getting the funding and how do you get the funding you really need people to believe in your costs and be able to see yes you know i trust her and she's able to do that work and and, and to carry on and also i think um in, in the place that I'm in, um, capacity building, human capacity is so important. So, and that's why I think, uh, you know, I, one of the things that I really realized with the permaculture training that we have done is um, that we need to do more and, you know, find one of those key, you know, students that we can actually adopt in and carry uh, that with us. Uh, so we, we need people with expertise, you know, even though I'm like here as a, you know, um, leading this, this this project, I still need people to support me. And sometimes it might be difficult uh, for people, you know, to come to Somalia. But yeah, so uh, any types of help. But I think one of the things John always says, funding comes, you know, but he's doing the other works, you know, building the foundations and things like that. And I believe him. So yeah, it's, it's all about, you know, the support, like even if we can get an online help, you know, people that can help us with their expertise, they're welcome. Thanks. And um, Yasmin, we also had some other questions for you um, from the group. So um, we, the, the folks online want to know um, how the community is feeling about the work that you're doing. Um, are they excited about this project? And, um, and also that they noticed um, that there are youth and children in the, the pictures that you shared in your presentation. And um, could you talk a little bit more about um, how you see youth being included um, in, in this work that you're doing? So the first question, you know, talking about the community, you know, I talked about how the, you know, people that we're trying to help, which is the nomadics, which is people who are in the ID camps, you know, youth, you know. So those people really feel the effect of climate change. They are the most who are suffering, uh, you know, with what is going on globally. Um, so with that regards, when you go deeper in, you know, like the community level, people are excited and, and they know we need to do something about it and they need help. But with the government and trying to convince them that this is important work is another level. So, I, and I think one of the things is, um, you know, here it's more like, we're used to handouts and, you know, it's an NGO world. So, and, and this is, you know, um, a 15 years project. So uh, there's no timeline. So it's not so easy for, for, you know, for big organizations to really support, but other the community itself, they know they need this and they're ready for it. So that is the question. With the regards to the youth, there is, you know, so many percent of the community are youth. They're young people, they're eager to learn. They, 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 they may not have the capacity and they you know, may not be able to, you know, but they're eager to learn. And, 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 and you know, with this uh, you know, um, 
creating um, e eco tourism and, and creating jobs for them. This is the whole purpose of doing this. It's, it's a, not just a restoring a land, but creating jobs for the youth. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, making sure that we're working in community and, and thinking about all of the stakeholders, um, our intergenerational relationships, um, and um, communities that may have been historically excluded from those processes. So thank you so much for, for bringing that into, into your work. Um, it, Max, we also have a question for you on um, the, from the, the audience. Um, and they would like to know a little bit more about how SECOM includes and integrates gender considerations into the work that it does as an organization. Yeah, we, we have to specify um, first the context in, in what kind of organization am I, am I talking right now? We have the farm level and um, that, that is uh, not easy to, to engage with um, women. Um, because uh, it is somewhere work in the field and it can be seen in the context of families and farm, farming families, but the, the, the agricultural work is mainly done also by, um, by male uh, people. And it is our um, challenge to bring out also uh, female um, engineers to live on the farm and to help in the organic agriculture. Whereas when it comes to the educational sphere, this is much uh, easier um, and we have a, a higher ratio um, with engaging with women, um, probably around 40 to 50%. In the companies, it's difficult. Um, all over uh, Egypt, um, the, the, the role model of, of, of women follow um, yeah, traditional patriarchal models where um, often women are, um, how, uh, work, working in the house when, when they get pregnant after marriage um, and, and stay at home. So our aim is to, to, to increase um, the, the general share of 20% women in, in Egypt to 50%. And we are on a, on a long journey. We have 25% women and we're trying to help um, as much as we can with uh, the nursery and the school and, and so on to offer women to bring their kids to our places. And that, that's that's promising, and um, and otherwise we really have to work on the cultural side, um, which which takes longer, which which takes longer time, and we have to invent also, um, yeah, uh, uh, part-time work models that are usually not easy in the, in the industry. For example, um, in the economic side. Uh, night shifts are not possible for, for women. Um, so we need to find out other ways to, to deal with that. But we are in the middle of the process. And um, one of our goals is to, um, to, to empower women and celebrate diversity more and to proactively engage with that. But it's a challenge here in this culture. Thank you, Max. Um, I think we've gotten to most of the questions. Um, we, I saw one question um, from the audience that's related to what type of what types of support that ERC provides to new camps or folks who are trying to get a project started. Um, as an organization, our strategy has been to look for groups who have already um, built some of their momentum um, on their own, um, like the, the presenters we've seen here today, um, and to accompany and, and make sure that those initiatives that have already gotten started um, get the support and, and, um, and connections that they need um, and global storytelling um, to help uh, regular people as well as donors understand what the opportunities are um, for restoration projects around the world. Um, in addition, we're also developing a free online course um, that we're expecting for next year that would help people get started in some of these activities um, and publish guides and, and, and best practices 
um, for some of that work. Um, we're also, as a way of supporting some of the folks in our network, we're also developing a knowledge exchange platform um, that will also create spaces for the broader community to be involved. So we definitely want to continue to motivate and inspire people to, to get involved in this work. And I'll talk a little bit about that when we close. Um, before, before, I want to um, open the conversation as well to um, all of our speakers. I know we have John Liu still here with us. Um, and I want to see if anyone um, has any final comments that they'd like to make or reflections that they've had in hearing the presentations. Um, and then I, I want to ask you a question about the, the current context of where we are um, in the climate negotiations and um, what you guys would like to see happen there. So I want to open the floor to anyone who wants to make some, some comments, um, some final closing comments. Silence. <laughs> Sorry, um, gosh. Well, thank you everybody. It's wonderful to hear the stories. And um, thank you, Aaron, for leading in the United States and to Peter and Jan Hein for the leadership in, in Europe. Um, I think we really need to get into a conversation about value because a lot of the discussion is about price of goods and services and trying to deliver products. And, and this assumes that the products are more valuable than the ecological function. And I think that this is fundamentally untrue. And so we have this mistake that's historical and that causes people to basically be almost enslaved in, into, into producing things which are not needed. There's, I don't know if you've seen in California, but there's, there's like shiploads of containers of stuff sitting there and it can't, they can't unload it fast enough. And the whole idea is that the economy only works if this stuff is bought and sold. Well, most of that stuff is gonna end up in the junk heap and is, is really not very useful. And what is the value of ecological function when we're facing human-induced climate changes? It's ridiculous. So if we, if we could figure out what the true value is and value the people who do the work to restore the earth, then we don't have this problem anymore. And I think that's, that's kind of where what I see is the next level of conversation to stop talking about uh, carbon trading, because I mean, that's just really just people who wanna control flows of money. Let's talk about how you get the, how you get functional ecosystems, how you maintain moisture in circulation in the lower atmosphere, how you stop having enormous greenhouse gas emissions and what people can do that is immediately useful to protect and, and, and restore equilibrium in, and stop having human impact on, on the climate. And to do that is more valuable than just buy and sell things. I just, I just wanna echo that, John, because I feel like there is a role. I mean, certainly there's the global leaders that are in conversation right now that have a lot of power to decide things but they are not the only players in ecosystem restoration, which is what I think ERC does so well, is that it creates a platform for anybody to get involved. And as in America, we are entering our most consumer time of year with Black Friday camping so that you can get a deal on the cheap TV microwave stereo system, then followed by Christmas, which is you know, the trash cans after Christmas are just overflowing. And then, you know, how many things by that June are in the trash can are broken from what that purchase. So, I mean, it's just these little small behaviors. And so maybe even a challenge 
for those that participate in those things in these next coming months to maybe reconsider the ways in which you're voting with your dollar, you know, and if ecosystem restoration feels important or protecting um, our planet feels important, uh, what are the ways that we can do that in our own lives with the day-to-day -day choices that we're making? Um, maybe you don't need that thing. Maybe you can borrow it from a neighbor and make a new relationship or, you know, perhaps it's a gift of like, I'm going to learn a native plant in my, my local ecosystem, right? Or I'm going to research what's going on in my local community of what's happening and, and get involved that way or understand your local politics of what's happening with your water resources or your crops. And so I think, you know, it can feel very overwhelming. It can feel very disheartening and hopeless. Um, but finding small little actions that you can take, um, even if it's walking somewhere, right? Like that makes a difference. And that is the one step, the first step that then can open your path to many other opportunities. And I think as the individual consumer, we have so much power, right? We have so much power uh, to make a difference on this planet. And so that is just a, an offering a hopeful message, a challenge um, as we move move forward in these coming days, weeks, months. Thank you so much, Geneva. I know really we are focused around those pathways for action so that you can get involved at an ecosystem restoration camp that's in your landscape, that's in your community, or you can connect um, with a site that might be halfway around the world from you and build those relationships um, either through distance or um, in some cases being able to actually go and, and, and build exchange in those places. Um, we have extended our, our time here and, and I really appreciate the presence of, of all of the speakers and this great conversation that we've heard from um, all of your experience. So um, I think we'll um, wrap up our, our conversation for today and we'll continue these events. Um, it's one of the great offerings that I think we have as a, as a group to hear directly um, from leaders such as yourselves who are doing this work on the ground. Um, just to let the audience know some other opportunities to get involved, um, we'd love for you to join us at a camp. All of the events that happen at our um, almost 50 camp partners around the world right now are available on our website at ecosystemrestorationcamps.org. There's a section of the website that talks about events that are available there. You can take a course on ecosystem restoration. We have um, several offerings that we developed. Um, and you can also sign up for our newsletter, which tells you specific um, information about which camps are um, news from, from camps, um, that is an email newsletter, but we also share information on LinkedIn and Facebook and Instagram. So if you're not following us on one of those platforms or more, um, look us up and make a connection with us there. And certainly also um, support for this work is really important. So if you're able to become a supporter, um, and as Geneva mentioned, transform that gift um, into something that has real impact on the ground, um, we encourage you to do so, whether that's making a small monthly donation or building um, a larger supporter relationship with our, with our group. Um, so thank you everyone so much for joining us and um, please feel free to reach out and we'd be happy to put you in touch with any of the speakers and we'll see you again soon.